thank you very much indeed for joining this discussion on crisis in Sri Lanka. I'm delighted to um, hand over the chair of this important event to Dr. David Page, and I look forward to his expert chairing of this discussion, which will identify the, the background, the drivers and possible solutions for the ongoing crisis in Sri Lanka. So David, thank you very much indeed, and I give you the floor. Thank you very much too. Uh, hello and welcome everyone to this um, online discussion on the crisis in Sri Lanka on behalf of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies here in London. Uh, my name is David Page, I'm a fellow of the Institute um, and I shall be your host for the next 90 minutes as we explore uh, the causes of the present political and economic crisis which has been rightly described as unprecedented in the island's independent history. We'll be exploring also the depth and significance of it and what could be done to put the country back on its feet. Um, for those of us in Britain who over the past 10 days have been pondering issues of continuity and change, as we've said farewell to our longest serving monarch, Elizabeth II, and, and begun the reign of Charles III, it's difficult, I think, to imagine the scale of change and the impact on ordinary people Sri Lanka has been experiencing over the past six months. A country which was once notable for its standards of education and health and its middle income status has been plunged into an economic crisis which has reduced much of the population to a life of shortages and poverty. In, many, uh, in May this year, the country defaulted on its debts and in the absence of foreign exchange, Sri Lankans experienced acute shortages of imported fuel, food and medicine and much else besides. People queued for days for these everyday items and a popular movement arose which was so widely supported that government ministers were forced to resign and the president to flee the country in July, though he's now returned at least temporarily. The protest movement was by and large peaceful, though there were incidents of violence directed at the political elite held responsible for the nation's troubles. It gave rise to a number of demands, not just for Gota to go, but for systemic change, uh, for an end to the executive presidency and for government closer to the people. A new president, Ronald Vikramasinghe, a UNP patrician and many times prime minister, now has the job of putting the country back on its feet. However, he is dependent on the parliamentary support of the SLPP, the former president's party, and far from listening to the demands of the protesters, he has declared a state of emergency and has been using the weight of the law against them. At the heart of the country's problems, therefore, there is a crisis of political legitimacy which is still being played out. Now, to help us to understand this crisis, we're fortunate in having four very well qualified Sri Lankan experts to speak to us today. Andana Ismail Abhivikrama, the editor in chief of the Sunday morning national newspaper, Vinya Arya Ratna, the president of Sarvodaya, Sri Lanka's uh, largest non government organization, Indrajit Kumaraswamy, former governor of the Central Bank, and Sumati Shivamohan, an academic uh, filmmaker and political activist and analyst. We've asked each speaker to speak for 10 minutes, after which I will take one or two questions to deal with specific points they've raised. We will keep the main question and answer session until all of them have spoken. If you have any questions, please write them in the Q&A, and we'll do our best to keep track of them. We will not be taking verbal questions. Um, I should also point out that this session is being recorded, and when you do um, ask a question uh, in the Q&A, we hope you'll make it clear who you are, so that we, um, we have a note of that. Now, um, to begin, I am going to ask Mandana Ismail uh, to give her account as a journalist who's been um, monitoring this movement from the beginning, give her account of the reasons why it developed, the extent of public support for it, demands it gave rise to, and also to say something about the role of the media, particularly social media, in mobilizing people and in demanding change. Mandana, uh, over to you. Thank you, David. Thank you very much for the invite. And uh, I see that there's a very impressive panel of speakers today. 
So I, uh, as you rightfully said, I will basically speak on the background, what led to the people's protest and uh, what followed, as well as where we stand at the moment, including the role of media. So um, I would like to start off by saying, if you look at the background of the people's protest, although it culminated uh, finally around April this year, the protest has been happening since last year, actually. It started with the farming community, where farmers in various pockets of the island started coming out and protesting, demanding fertilizer. Uh, there was an issue with fertilizer following uh, former president uh, Gotabe Rajapaksa's uh, sudden policy decision of banning chemical fertilizer imports and uh, demanding that it only organic fertilizer be used for farming while there were no facilities to meet the fertilizer demand of the country. So this resulted in farmers being unable to carry on with their livelihoods. So it was in fact, the people's protest was initiated first by the farming community in the country. They took to the streets, they started protesting on the streets Organ eventually started organizing mass protests and marches and rallies. Then coupled with it, started the power crisis because apart from the impending food crisis, the power crisis came on and the long hours of power cuts and its impact on businesses, small businesses especially, as well as the general public resulted in uh, people in urban areas, especially the middle class coming out on the streets it started off as a candlelit vigil, one hour candlelit vigil every night in uh, key towns in urban areas, especially Colombo. So this is how the protest movement gathered momentum. It started from 2021 and it continued. And by April, people were beginning to feel the, feel the difficulties. And that is when the protest became more mag like magnified and people started to notice it then resulting in the whole Gota Go Gama being set up in golf face and the continuous protest campaign that lasted for over 100 days until uh, for the first time in Sri Lanka's history, a sitting president was ousted, resulting in the president having to flee and including his uh, government having to resign, his brother, the prime minister, former prime minister, Mahindra Rajapaksa having to resign and another brother, former finance minister, Basil Rajapaksa having to resign and, and his government as well. So since then, it has been the public's demand for, a, for accountability, for new laws to be introduced to uh, retrieve the, what they called assets, public assets that had been swindled by successive governments and for basically a system change. When they said a system change, they call for political and economic reforms. But unfortunately, that demands have still not been met. The political reforms that were called was basically based on the abolition of the executive presidency, as well as bringing, bringing in accountability, bringing in laws that would curtail or prevent corruption and bribery that have long caused the financial issues the country is currently facing, apart from the economic crisis brought on by the uh, global pandemic, Sri Lanka also had a building economic crisis in the form of uh, massive loans being obtained from, from foreign countries. And those projects that the monies were invested in have so far be, failed to give any proper returns. So in mm. other words, basically they have been limited to vanity projects of several individuals uh, mm. born at heavy public cost. So these are the debt burdens that actually have managed to cripple the country at the moment. So. The people are right in demanding for accountability. After all, it is public funds. But then again, whether the politicians are listening to it, whether the powers, uh, the government at present is listening to it is yet another issue to be looked at because so far the trust deficit between the politicians and the people has still not been bridged. And there doesn't seem to be any signs of that gap being bridged anytime soon either. So therefore Sri Lanka is definitely at crossroads when it comes to its political as well as economical fronts. And it, during this crisis, as the media, there was a new challenging role for the media as well. It was, it was difficult for the media to also define its role, given the fact that the whole people's protest movement itself came from including media personnel as well. So there were, there were, there were questions raised 
by on on ethical grounds whether media personnel should participate in these protests or whether as citizens they too had rights or how would they report if they are part of a process or a protest how would they how would it impact on their reporting what about unbiased reporting so there were so many challenges like media had to had to face we we all had to have discussions i mean frequent discussions in our news desks to decide basically how we would approach a story how can we cover it because at a time like that there was also a humanitarian crisis as well building up and following the violence that was taking place on especially on the 9th of may the issue of how the media should address this crisis and how media should look at crisis sensitive journalism was one of the aspects that really really posed a challenge for mainstream media as well however the i mean when it came to social media since uh, there are no particular laws like confining them it was more open it was a more open platform so we saw a lot of uh, people turning towards social media during this period of the people's protest and we saw people i mean there were lots of people coming out with their stories with their videos and there were basically citizens journalism citizens coming forward with their stories was very very vast at that time so it was a challenge so that i think has opened a new avenue for even the media to kind of reconsider its role in this evolving process because uh when it comes to people's protests and when it comes to a crisis situation in the country and when it comes to accountability issues how should the media take it forward and while while being a credible source of information as opposed to questions being raised on news stories or even even posts on social media how can the mainstream media especially print and broadcast take it forward so these are challenges that we have been continuously facing in fact even now now the question is about okay how do we move forward what about the what about the demands of the people now that the people's protest has ended at least for the time being what about the demands what about the accountability factor what about the what about the economic crimes which has now been taken up even at the U united nations human rights council sri lanka has been questioned on economic crimes for the first time in its history so there are serious issues even for the media to take on and what about when it comes to socio economic issues so it's been quite a challenge and like even amongst our colleagues we have been having several rounds of informal discussions actually on what stories to approach how do we go forward how do we make a push for the political and economic reforms that people are demanding or isn't it the time to push for it given the fact that there's a for the first time in the country there's a huge public momentum growing on it and especially with the current government uh not showing positive signs on addressing the people's demands and what what initially was promised to the people saying there will be there will be participation from civil societies hereafter in the governance process i mean so far there have been lots of talk but even the national council where where the president promised to appoint several members from the civil society who can serve as observers and propose uh, propose their uh, make proposals to the governance process has still not taken off the ground and people are becoming fast restless again and we can see protests happening once again in various pockets of the island over the increase in utility bills increase in food prices as well as everything i mean we are, we are facing a food crisis and malnutrition is also on the rise despite attempts to counter such claims by the government uh, multilateral organizations like the world bank have all come forward with their latest updated reports showing that sri lanka is facing an economic crisis and the un resident coordinator to sri lanka just a few days back appealed for support for sri lanka calling on friends to come forward and help sri lanka that sri lanka is facing a crisis so it's only going to get worse given the fact that the imf uh IMF agreement that the Sri Lanka is working on the EF uh, EF extended fund facility program that Sri Lanka is working on will also bring in some difficult uh, reforms that the government will have to adhere to and that will also result in more more difficulties to the public so that means we might not have seen the end of the people's protest given the fact that it's starting once again so it might not be the end 
So this will pose another round of challenges, not only to the politicians, but also to the general public on how they are going to take it forward more strategically than last time. And for the media on how they will approach this and how they will take it forward as well. So I think uh, I will uh, stop at that, David, because I'm sure the rest of the speakers will have more statistics and give more details on these issues. So uh, once you. again, thank you very much for having thank, me. Thank you very much. Can I just ask you a couple of very quick questions? Um, sure. Dave. One, as, as far as the movement is concerned, I mean, one had the impression that this was a movement very, very widely supported from across the island by ordinary Sri Lankans of different ages and so on. Um, to what extent were, if you like, existing uh, centres of political um, uh, organisation uh, involved in this? And to what extent is this, if you like, a new movement uh, with, with a very young uh, participation, which is actually, uh, if you like, in some sense, offering a new kind of future for the country? That's one question. The second question I just wanted to ask you is, it, what is the state of the media now? Are you able to do your job under the state of emergency that's been uh, declared? Yes, uh, the first question. Uh, the answer to the first one is yes, we see more youth participation in, uh, in, in the decision-making process at the moment, because unlike maybe a few years ago, following the people's protests, we saw a lot of youth getting involved in this and we see them actually showing an interest for the, I mean, in my journalism career, I have not seen youth involvement in politics as this much. They're actually talking of their rights. Unlike earlier, the youth are actually talking of their rights and, their, and they seem more politically attuned now than earlier. And, and it seems as if like, you know, even the people's protest has kind of taken a message to the, to, to the even the rural areas where they are more politically attuned and where they are, where I feel like there's some form of political awareness about their rights and the fact that the public has been deprived of their rights and that uh, politicians who are tone deaf, I would say, are continuing to ignore what the people actually want. They seem so far away from reality. So I feel that this is this people's protest and the recent protest campaign and all would would result in some form of youth participation in the political uh, process in the future. And uh, yes, it has also created a vacuum. It has brought out a vacuum because people, especially the youth seem to be moving away from the traditional mainstream political parties. So my analysis would be that for the next election, no single party might be able to secure a majority mm -hmm. unless it is, it is a political alliance driven by people with conviction who are willing to make those changes that the public is demanding and people, at least new people, whom the public feel they could trust because the parliament, the current parliament, which has also lost its mandate to a great extent, has lost faith among people. So people will also want people whom they could trust representing them in parliament. So there seems to be a momentum gathering, although at a very small level at as yet, yet, well, I feel there's uh, more time for it to build up. Mm. And, and uh, for the media, are yes. you able to report without fear or favor? Well, at the moment, we are we we are managing to do that fine. But uh, there are also moves to bring in certain um, regulations and laws, uh, especially for digital media. So that is still in discussion. And there are like, you know, I mean, activists and media organizations continue to express concerns because while we agree that there may be a need for some form of regulation to curtail misinformation, disinformation and hate speech, it should also not curtail the uh, space for free speech and freedom of expression. So there are certain laws that are being drafted or being discussed at the moment so we are hopeful that given the current crisis situation and given the current situation, there will be some form of pressure that the media, especially the media organizations and the media activists could put on the government, uh, despite the fact that the government has so far shown that it is not, not willing to kind of take on heavy criticism with a lot of activists currently 
being held behind bars and some actually being detained on detention orders. So at the moment, when it comes to reporting, we have not had any issue, but we are concerned about the laws that are being discussed to kind of uh, curtail certain um, freedoms, of, especially of media. And uh, we are hopeful that together with the activists and the media organizations, we would be able to safeguard the space that we have at the moment. Good. Well, thank you very much, Madhu. That's very, very clear. Um, now I'm going to call now um, Vinya Arya Ratna, who is the president of uh, Sarvodaya. Um, and uh, Sarvodaya is the, the largest non-government organization in Sri Lanka. And um, it has been involved in recent months in providing emergency humanitarian assistance for uh, several hundred thousand people who have been suffering as a result of the economic crisis. Now, um, Vinya is also a medical doctor by profession, so he has a keen eye on the health um, implications of the crisis. And so over to you, Vinya, to uh, uh, explain to us what is the scale of the humanitarian crisis which this economic, uh, uh, economic crisis has, has created. Thank you very much, uh, David, and thank you, um... Uh, I'd like to thank the Institute for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Uh, let me uh, use some slides that would uh, make uh, my presentation uh, easier. So uh, <clears throat> I would like to expand on what has already been uh, mentioned by uh, Mandana in, with regard to the humanitarian crisis and, the, and how it is uh, impacting on the vulnerable and also the humanitarian uh, response. So uh, the first point I would like to make is that, uh, you know, this present crisis uh, evolved with, uh, you know, the crisis that we faced as a result of COVID-19. And also there was a context in which the people were also having serious difficulties even before the COVID-19 pandemic. We have had uh, the Easter Sunday attack and, you know, there was a lot of disruption to economic activities as a result, including you know, tourism and also the small enterprises connected to tourism. So there was a there was an evolution of a crisis uh, since uh, probably uh, early 2019. Now, uh, if you look at the COVID-19 situation, it's very important for us to understand, the, the particularly when you look at, say, the nutritional indicators, what was the situation before uh, COVID-19? And uh, David referred to, you know, the impressive uh, statistics that we have had in terms of health and social uh, um, uh, social uh, development. So we are always, you know, very proud about our achievements with regard to uh, life expectancy, you know, having low infant mortality rate and so many other indi uh, health indicators like the under five mortality rate, the maternal mortality rate, and also having a highly literate population. For a uh, relatively low per capita income, I mean, we achieved these indicators, satisfactory indicators, even before we became a middle income country. However, the problem was that we had uh, very serious disparities, significant disparities between districts and even sometimes within districts or between uh, different ethnic uh, groups or even between socioeconomic classes. So we have to remember that when there is a, a new crisis, particularly an economic crisis, it will affect disproportionately certain groups. So existing inequities or inequalities can get exacerbated. That's exactly what happened uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic as well. So if you look at, despite all these uh, impressive health indicators, we have been seriously lagging behind when it came to nutrition, particularly under five, the nutritional status of under five children, uh, in 2016, which is, uh, you know, the, the last uh, sort of large scale uh, survey that was done under demographic, demographic and health survey, 20% uh, of our children were underweight and also the wasting was quite unacceptably high, 15% uh, and stunting, which reflects the level of chronic malnutrition in the country, 17.3. So all these uh, indicators show that we were uh, really not performing very well when it comes to uh, when it came to food security and nutrition and when you look at poverty also even before this crisis started in 2019 even if you look at the poverty levels the uh, the head count was quite high with again significant disparities across different districts in sri lanka so there are 25 uh, administrative districts in sri lanka 
and the, even though the average may be relatively low, but still it's high, higher than what is reported in certain uh, government statistics, which says the poverty is below 5%, but actually this particular survey, the, income, the household income and expenditure survey clearly uh, uh, shows that it is 14.3 uh, uh, and with a range from 2.3 in Colombo district to as high as 44.5% in the northern Mulatiu district. So um, this situation definitely got exacerbated uh, during the uh, COVID-19. And also, if you look at the multidimensional poverty index, which is a much more robust and much more comprehensive index, not reflecting just the uh, income poverty, but you look at education, health, and standards of living. Here again, it is very high headcount ratio of 16%, and also significant disparities across different districts in Sri Lanka. And then when we came to the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, of course, we know it has had a very significant impact, a very negative impact on the most vulnerable groups. If you uh, look at, uh, in general, 73% uh, of the households reported a negative impact on their income. And it started uh, uh, with, uh, uh, say, about 11% household of households um, well, totally uh, having no income. Starting with in April 2020, like 40%, nearly 40%, it has come down, of course, in the income reduced in 62% of households. And of course, uh, a certain percentage was okay. So again, how did, it, how did the population, this particularly the vulnerable groups, cope with this situation? So they uh, started selling their belongings. But the most uh, uh, striking thing was that they started borrowing money from 2020 April up until uh, 2022 uh, April. So within a period of uh, 12, uh, 24 months, two years, you could see uh, how uh, the situation has got worsened. So they were also withdrawing from savings and also pawning their belongings. So indebtedness has also increased and we see that with the onset of the present economic crisis since late last year or beginning of this year, this situation has got worsened. So the impact has also been very much on food consumption. 70% of the households reduced their food consumption and primarily due to rising cost of food. And the nutritional service, <coughs> services were also negatively affected. We had, uh, for example, food supplementation schemes, uh, what we call triposha, and even the factory started uh, uh, stopped their operations because it didn't have the uh, raw material uh, to produce this nutritional supplement. So the, the impact was very much on the poorer households of Sri Lanka and particularly the children, the pregnant women, the lactating women and the elderly. So also the impact on the children, aside from uh, the education being in, uh, disrupted during the COVID-19, Sri Lanka has uh, extended closure of schools due to the fuel crisis because the children couldn't go to school and the schools were also closed down in between and significant disruption was there and that has also affected their mental health. So if you look at the uh, nutritional indicators more carefully, in recent months we have seen as Mandana also referred to, which has been also reported in the press, uh, and also the government is uh, 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 rejecting all these uh, uh, re uh, reports which are based on uh, scientific evidence. It's very unfortunate because if we are to address a problem, we need to acknowledge that this is, this is there. So the moderate to severe acute malnutrition, although severe acute malnutrition at the time of this particular survey by the Med Medical Research Institute wasn't that high, but the moderate acute malnutrition uh, was very high. This is an indicator where you measure the, uh, the uh, weight of the children uh, proportionate to their height. And you could see that uh, the, uh, the level is more than 10%. And this can become very severe. And the uh, children who are also normal can be easily shifted to a level of moderate acute malnutrition. So it is in this context that the economic crisis set in in early uh, January or February this year. Now, if you look at the food uh, inflation, particularly the, the what you call the general headline inflation, uh, has been very high. And year-on-year -year, uh, in, inflation based on the Colombo Consumer Price Index uh, is uh, from the month of August 
uh, it increased from 60.8% to 64. But the more important uh, uh, deterioration is really the uh, uh, food inflation, which uh, is at 937 in August, just last month. So uh, people just cannot afford, particularly the, those, those who belong to lower income groups, they just cannot uh, afford to have a square meal. And we have seen them reducing the number of meals and also the, uh, the quality of food they consume has also uh, been uh, very much uh, less than what is optimal. So we are facing a multidimensional crisis, which is confounded by the food insecurity, threatened livelihoods. And as it was mentioned, the fertilizer ban directly impacted on the food production and food availability and the prices. Then there is a severe shortages of vital and essential medicines and also rising protection concerns for children, women, and other socially vulnerable groups. So despite ongoing efforts by the civil society organizations, UNICEF and development partners, humanitarian needs in Sri Lanka continue to deteriorate. And even the re most recent report says that there are about 6.2 million people or nearly 30% of the population are at risk of food insecurity. And also the reduction of uh, household uh, income uh, is also impacting and also the coping strategy include mainly cutting down on food. Then there is also protection uh, concerns, including increased violence against children and also uh, gender-based violence and also uh, serious sexual exploitation and abuse of uh, women. Uh, hospitals are also functioning with great difficulty due to lack of medicines, uh, devices and supplies. And also the people find it extremely difficult to access uh, due to transport, access hospitals, healthcare due to transport problems uh, because they would wait until the situation, the condition get worse. Uh, and then you will have a higher level of mortality uh, deaths in the future. Then the psychosocial impact uh, is huge. Uh, and so how to address this? So there is food insecurity. If you uh, look at certain geographic areas, the central province, eastern province, and northern province are at, at much higher risk. And out of the 25 districts in Sri Lanka, you can see about eight districts are really significantly affected by food insecurity. Therefore, the interventions need to be at the moment targeted. And we started this. Our response is to really look at the food insecurity in a very comprehensive way. So we selected eight out of the 25 administrative districts, which were most vulnerable. Uh, and we are uh, uh, initiating an integrated uh, program. So in these uh, eight districts, uh, starting with Nuerelia, which is uh, in the tea plantation areas, and in the eastern province and the northern province, we have started this integrated program, which is uh, a social safety net program. And our target is to reach about 500,000 families within a period of one year. And uh, I will cut short my presentation because I have only another two minutes. Um, this campaign is really focused on uh, uh, collective efforts by communities supplemented by external donor support because we want it to sustain uh, to the extent that's possible uh, until this immediate acute food crisis uh, uh, is overcome where the macro economy probably uh, improves. I, I think it will take at least three years for us to come back to the pre-COVID situation or pre-economic crisis uh, period. So we implement three important interventions. One is a community kitchen. The other one is a food bank. And then we also promote home gardening. So community kitchens are attached to either preschools and there's a lot of community uh, contribution coming in. But we, through donor support, provide dry rations uh, to run uh, these community kitchens uh, attached to preschools. And also it's not uh, uh, preschools, but we also provide the same support for urban to run urban community kitchens and also limited number of uh, uh, primary schools. Uh, uh, the state primary schools are also being supported. And there are many groups, not just Arvode, there are many groups. There's huge amount of humanitarian response uh, coming support coming from the general public as well. So hundreds and thousands of community uh, uh, preschool children are benefited by the community kitchen program. Then we also are setting up uh, food banks at local level in religious institutions, community centers, and even in our own Sarvodaya community uh, district centers around the country. And people can donate food and also take 
from those uh, food banks. And also we encourage uh, the private sector also to partner. So we have a large consortium of private organizations, private sector corporates in Sri Lanka uh, to support the dry ration distribution program. We plan to reach 200,000 families. Already we have uh, passed 120,000 families uh, mark. And we hope that we'll be able to uh, rope in uh, other corporate donors and continue this program at least for another nine months. So we have we are targeting to mobilize a large amount of uh, financial resources and we have been so far quite successful. And then home gardens are also an integral part of this program. We don't uh, see that you know home gardens will solve the food uh, uh, crisis. No, it will. But it will definitely have a very big impact, positive impact, and also uh, inculcate these uh, values amongst children uh, to grow something and also reconnect with their nature. With nature, that will also be a healing uh, process for to overcome their psychosocial uh, trauma. And we have uh, already started more than 600 uh, home gardens, and we are distributing uh, seed packs uh, which are appropriate to different climatic zones of Sri Lanka. Um, so. Can I, Finally, stop you? Can, I, can I stop yeah. you there? Um, yes. Uh, um, Vinaya, I, it's such a lot of very valuable information. Um, um, and, and really also, uh, you know, the statistics you provided us are really quite heartrending, aren't they? The scale of malnutrition in Sri Lanka is, is, uh, is, is very, very worrying indeed. Um, would you mind very much if we, we pause at that point? I mean, I think there are all sorts of questions that one would like to ask you about what has the international response been to this? Um, but uh, maybe we can come back to that a little bit later, um, if that's all right. And, that's fine. Uh, and we'll, we'll move on, if I may now, to, to um, look at the macro financial information that uh, um, we, uh, the macroeconomic situation, and, and I'll ask Indrajit uh, Kumaraswamy, a former governor of the Central Bank, if he would, to, um, to say something about how Sri Lanka got into this extraordinary uh, financial difficulty, and, and also um, what is being done to try and uh, put matters back on an even keel, particularly with regard to the discussions that are going on uh, with the um, with the with the IMF. So, uh, Indrajit, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this um, very eminent panel. And I think Vinaya's uh, presentation has given us a very graphic and dramatic uh, description of the uh, the human and humanitarian the humanitarian and social impact of the crisis. So, on the macro side, as for the genesis of the crisis. You know, at the time of independence, Sri Lanka was second to Japan on most socioeconomic indicators. Now, there, were, there is complex causality for the regression from that uh, position. Uh, there are economic factors, social factors, political factors. But in my view, the most significant causal factor has been consistent macroeconomic stress. Throughout the last 70 odd years, there has been consistent macroeconomic stress. And the main source of that macroeconomic stress has been the government's budgetary operations. And Professor John Robinson, who is certainly no neoclassical economist uh, from Cambridge, came to Sri Lanka in the late 50s. And she said, you Silanese, Sri Lanka was alone there, you Silanese have eaten the cake before you planted the tree. So that I think is a very, very graphic description of what has happened in Sri Lanka for over the last 70 years. We've lived basically beyond our means. Now, um, for some time now, Sri Lanka has been a twin deficit country, which is the most vulnerable uh, category of countries. Sri Lanka has had a, had a, a unsustainable deficit in its budget, and it has had an unsustainable deficit in the current account of its balance of payments. Now, the cause for the budgetary uh, problems in the particularly in the last sort of 25 30 years has been the gradual erosion of revenue revenue has gone from about 20 over 20% 20 of gdp now down to about 8% now i'm happy in the discussion to give you the reasons why that has happened but that is what has happened and expenditure remains at around 20% of gdp which is actually an acceptable number the overall expenditure level is actually uh, acceptable in relation to our 
uh, comparator countries. But of course, there is a lot that can be said about improving the quality of expenditure as to where we should prioritize public expenditure. That There is a lot that can be done. Uh, then on the, on the balance of payment side, uh, the main reason for the persistent current account deficit is that there has been consistently a bias against exports in our policy framework. There has been an overvalued exchange rate. There have been high levels of protection, which has diverted money uh, into, uh, to, into activity that is geared toward the very small domestic market rather than the global market. And there have been paratariffs, which have led to the exclusion of Sri Lanka from global supply chains, the most dynamic component of the international trading system. So these factors have meant that Sri Lanka has had uh, you know, this twin deficit. And the, uh, it really is kind of as was vulnerable uh, as an economy even before the onset of the pandemic. Um, then, in fact, Sri Lanka can be characterized over the last so many years, uh, certainly after 77, 78 liberalization of the economy, can be characterized as a high budget deficit, high inflation, high nominal interest rate, overvalued currency economy. And I can spell this out in the discussion more, but if you look at that characterization, it is diametrically the opposite to the characterization of the successful countries of East and Southeast Asia. So this is why we have kind of slipped backwards uh, in, in the Asian pecking order. Uh, and I, I must say the reason why Sri Lanka was able to keep moving forward, or one of the reasons why Sri Lanka was able to be, keep moving forward in terms of having good social indicators and also graduating from low income to middle income country status, because Sri Lanka was a donor darling. When Sri Lanka liberalized the economy in 77, 78, it was the second country to do so after Chile. Of those countries that went down the Dirigiso, inward uh, looking economic policies. Now, Chile was a dictatorship under Pinochet. Sri Lanka was a, a, a liberal economy and it had a multi-party, open, democratic political system. So the traditional donors, that's the Western countries and Japan, were very keen to demonstrate good development outcomes in a country which had a liberal polity and a liberal economy. So they gave us extremely generous levels of, of foreign aid. This was not good for us in the long run because it meant that we did not have to take the tough decisions we had to make to make sure that we lived within our means, to make sure that we put money into structural reforms. Instead, we used to have uh, get into an unsustainable crisis repeatedly and then go to the IMF. We went to the IMF. We have been to the IMF 16 times. This is the 17th time we're going. And, that, and we'd get a bailout, but we'd get the bailout on very concessional terms. Because all this assistance that we got from the donor community at that time, and about 60% or more of it came from the concessional windows of the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. And this was money of 30, 40 year maturity, 10 year grace period, less than 1% uh, charges. So, you know, with that kind of never, never money, we kind of kept going and were able to progress. And then we graduated to middle income country status around the late kind of, Around 2010 is when we, I think, eventually were graduated out of even blended uh, financing. But that meant we became exposed to rating agencies and international capital markets. And that means you have to have a far more disciplined macroeconomic policy making. But we did not adjust to the new paradigm that we were in. We carried on in our usual ways. And over time, we accumulated debt. And... Uh, the debt crisis hit us now. Uh, uh, the pandemic, of course. So there were these. I've set out some um, historical uh, causes which have led to the position we've got to now. But there have been some proximate causes also which have amplified the problem. One was the pandemic. Clearly, the, the, there were a couple of exogenous proximate causes: the pandemic, the commodity prices, particularly after the Ukraine war. Those were both beyond our control and exogenous, but within our power were some of the mistakes that we made in relation to, one, the misguided tax cuts. And once we made those tax cuts, the, the lost revenue had to be made up through deficit financing by the central bank, i.e. money printing, um, large amounts of money printing to make up for the loss of revenue. And also the central bank indulged in financial repression. That is, they kept interest rates artificially down which again led to 
uh, and uh, uh, basically a over overheating of the economy. And we've seen the balance of payments problem that has come through and the inflation that has come through. Problems are compounded by the fertilizer ban as well. That's another endogenous problem, mistake made by us. And finally, the delay in going to the IMF. It was clear once the tax cuts took place and the pandemic hit, by around April, May of 2020, it was clear as night follows day that we would have to go to the IMF for a bailout. But we delayed till, till 2022. And that meant that the depth of the problem, the severity of the crisis, was much greater than we needed have been. Needed have been. There were a lot of uh, economists, eminent economists, uh, who were writing that we needed to go to the IMF for some time. Uh, but that didn't happen, partly because uh, you know we couldn't go to the IMF without debt restructuring. Our debt was deemed unsustainable after the tax cuts and the pandemic. And the government was very reluctant to, to restructure its debt. And that's, I think, why they didn't, want, they didn't go to the IMF. There were also ideological reasons they didn't want to go to the IMF. So that, that's how we got into this mess. What is being done? So the government has reached a staff level agreement with the IMF. Uh, and the program uh, set out in the uh, staff level agreement aims to restore macroeconomic stability and debt sustainability. While uh, preserving financial system stability, protecting the most vulnerable, unlocking the country's growth potential through structural reforms, and improving economic governance. So those are the aims of the program. So what are some of the key reforms? Revenue-enhanced uh, fiscal consolidation, cost recovery based on uh, cost recovery based pricing for fuel and electricity, restoring price stability, including phasing out deficit financing or money printing by the central bank greater autonomy for the central bank and having flexible inflation targeting as a framework for monetary policy, rebuilding foreign reserves through restoring a market-oriented uh, uh, flexible exchange rate, safeguarding the financial system uh, by ensuring adequately capitalized banking system, and most important probably now, given after what we've heard from, from Vinya, uh, we need to strengthen our social, uh, social safety net particularly the cash transfer program. Now, you know, I, uh, I think subsidies have proven to be not very effective or efficient. It has a lot of empirical work that shows that in Sri Lanka, the subsidies have gone disproportionately to the non-poor. The, the people who really need it don't always get it. And people who don't necessarily need it get it because of the political patronage system that we have. So the targeting is poor and the design is poor. So we need to have a better design and a ramped up cash transfer program, not, not subsidies. Subsidies distort relative prices, lead to misallocation of resources and benefit the non-poor, as I said. Instead, you need to put cash in the hands of the people who really need it. But for that, you need to have a way of identifying them in a, in a, in a robust an objective way. And there, Professor Delaney Gunwardner of, of, of Peradeni University has done some work to show that electricity consumption is a good determinant of uh, the people's level of need. Uh, and I think she said it's something like 60, uh, uh, 60 kilowatt hours per month, I think it was. I can't remember what the exact uh, variable she used. But because 98% of the households in the country are linked to the national grid. So that's very granular and accurate data on electricity consumption. So it can be used as a determinant of eligibility for this cash transfer program. In addition, we need to get the program that is already being put together to give people an electronic ID and, and, and then to disperse this money directly into their bank accounts using the electronic ID. That's what the ADA scheme in India does, and that can be replicated in Sri Lanka without too much difficulty. So we need to get to that. So we need to build up this social safety net and the cash transfer program. And certainly for the next six months, there has to be a very big focus on getting this going and delivering this very efficiently. Hopefully beyond that, you know, things might ease up a little bit. And, and uh, uh, But certainly we have to find the money and the donors seem to be willing to give the money. Uh, so there's quite a lot of money that has already been identified for this, and more will come if we have a well-designed program which actually targets those who need it. Um, now, it's not enough to uh, uh, 
Now, how do we go? So we, are, we have this staff level agreement. Where do we go from here? The staff level agreement is the first step and it then has to be approved by the executive board of the IMF. Uh, and then we'll be eligible for an extended fund facility drawing of $2.9 billion over four years. But it's not the money from the IMF that really matters because having an IMF program will then uh, catalyze money from the Asian Development Bank, fresh money from the Asian Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and possibly some of the bilateral donors as well. So it's a catalytic, catalytic effect of the IMF program that's most important because the IMF kind of certifies good uh, economic management. Uh, and then on the back of that, people will be more willing to give us money um, but being a non-credit worthy country, at the moment, we're having great difficulty in attracting any money, public or private. So we, there are some prior actions that need to be done to go from the staff level agreement to the extended fund facility. One is there probably will be the budget speech in November uh, 2022. We'll have to set out the agreed revenue measures. Uh, that are necessary for 2023. Already the president introduced an interim budget with measures for the last four, four months or so of this year. So those fiscal measures were part of the prior actions. Uh, and some of the other measures that I told talk to you about, some of the other reforms of already electricity prices, fuel prices, there's been movement on all of these things, but we need to carry out exactly what we need to do. For instance, there's a little bit more to go on the electricity prices. Um, and, and we need to work on the central bank autonomy and the central bank, uh, new central bank uh, bill. Uh, so there are things like that which are still a work in progress and they need to be implemented uh, as we get into the program. Um, now, so prior actions, particularly, as I said, the fiscal measures for this year and next. And the other key prior action is we have to demonstrate that we are on our way to debt sustainability. And there, the, the government has already uh, hired some advisors, Lazard as their debt advisor, financial advisor, and Clifford Chance as their legal advisor. And they have worked out now, from what I understand, basically a, a, a scenario for uh, restructuring our debt. One can't restructure multilateral debt. So the debt that's being restructured is the bilateral debt and debt from commercial sources, particularly the international sovereign bond. Um, now, there's a question mark whether we can get to where we need to get to in terms of debt sustainability by restructuring only our external debt. That is what the government is doing. It has instructed the, the, uh, the advisors to do their utmost to limit the restructuring to the two categories of external debt that I spoke about. Um, um, now, the bilateral debt has the Paris Club members plus India and China. Paris Club is basically the OECD countries uh, and the uh, India and China are the other key uh, bilateral creditors. Uh, and the, the, the ISBs are held by mainly uh, um, these uh, various investment funds around the world, particularly uh, in the US uh, uh, and, and, and Europe as well. Uh, now, these are things that we need to do. Um, we are, it's a tough task um, and really for us to get out of this, okay? So that, what I've talked to you about now is mainly what is necessary for stabilizing the situation. The IMF program, the debt restructuring, et cetera, is to stabilize the situation. And some progress has been made, we need to persist. But to get out of this situation, we have to be far more robust than we have been in undertaking structural reforms. By that, I mean reforms to the, the, the factor markets, land, labor, and capital, the investment climate, the trade policy, uh, trade facilitation, uh, in, uh, getting our education, training, and skills development sector uh, organized. So all these other structural reforms, which we've known about for years, but we've never really done anything very effective about. We've got away with it because we used to get this money coming in to bail us out, initially on concessional terms. That ran out. We got into serious trouble because we then got got out of the concessional uh, assistance mode into commercial assistance, which then meant that we got into a very unsustainable position and a major crisis. And now to get out of it, we need to one, as I say, take those stabilization measures, but more importantly, at the same time, do these structural reforms. In the past uh, IMF programs, we did, sorry, yeah. Indrajit, I think, um, may I uh, stop you there? If I, sure, if I could. sure. Um, sure. Um, 
That's very... Um, I pretty very, much finished, yeah. Very informative, actually. Um, I mean, one of the things that has already happened, of course, un under the, um, uh, as a result of these IMF discussions, is that the electricity prices have gone up, VAT has gone up, but so far as we know, these cash, uh, targeted cash uh, for the poor has not yet happened. And is there a danger, as there very often is with these IMF uh, uh, discussions, that it will make the situation worse for ordinary people and that getting it into a better shape is going to take a long time and that this, there's, a, there's, a, there's a political risk in all of this. Yeah. So the first thing to, I think, uh, recognize is that the crisis has not been caused by the IMF. You know, it has been caused by, uh, you know, exogenous factors, as I said, like the pandemic, like the, the, the Ukraine war, et cetera, but to a large extent by our own policies, right? So that's the important thing to first remember. IMF didn't cause this problem. We went, we have gone to the IMF to help us to get out of this situation. But if you are in a situation where you, you, you don't have enough dollars, you don't have enough rupees, then you have to A, find a way of stabilizing the situation by reducing consumption and investment in the, in, in the system. There is no other way of getting out of it. Until you, you do that and get yourself into a stable position, nobody is going to give you additional money. That's the problem. Okay. So well, there is going to be pain. There is going to be pain. Another question from William Crawley. I mean, how important is the debt to China about which we hear so much in all of this? Well, the stock of debt to China is 10% of our total external debt. So the Chinese debt hasn't caused the crisis. But we can say that, you know, one of the problems we've had is when we moved into commercial borrowing, we didn't screen the projects well enough. The, the borrowing we undertook did not earn or save enough foreign exchange to service the debt because it went in into non-tradable sectors which were not generating uh, uh, or saving foreign exchange. And there is now, of course, uh, commentary about the fact that it, there was corruption, there's inefficiency, various other things. So whatever it is, uh, uh, the Chinese debt is material, but it was up to us to make sure that we use the borrowings from China very uh, eff efficiently, which we didn't. But, you know, the two things. There is a stock of Chinese debt, but it is not the thing that has caused the crisis. But we could have used the Chinese money much better. Okay, thank you very much. Well, now, um, I'd like to call on um, uh, Sumati Shivamohan, um, who is a professor of literature at Peridona University and a filmmaker and, uh, and a political activist and analyst um, who... Um, has been thinking a good deal about issues of nationality um, and identity in Sri Lanka. And uh, I know, uh, Jumati, you've been thinking about if the protest movement from the point of view of the, the minorities in the country, the Tamils and the Muslims particularly. I just wonder if you could say something about how you see the protest movement, uh, to what extent those communities are uh, have been involved in this, and to what extent they are also hoping for um, a new future and, and uh, a better uh, systemic uh, or systemic change and, and a, a different uh, constitutional arrangement, really, which would, uh, which would be more to the, uh, which, which would involve them uh, to a greater extent than it has in the past. Okay, thank you, David. Would you also warn me when we are, I'm like close to eight minutes? Uh, I'll tell you. Yes, me, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so I have titled uh, what I'm going to say democracy and minorities. But before I talk about that as a sub as a topic, I also want to uh, uh, point to something that uh, Indrajit Kumar Swami said, and I. Uh, our my position and the groups that I belong to, uh, the positions of the groups I belong to, hold very diametrically opposite uh, view on um, the, the structural adjustment programs and the economic uh, uh, collapse that we are facing. I have to say this because uh, it is connected to what I'm going to say uh, too. Uh, in terms of democracy and minorities, we uh, 
while uh, Mandana uh, uh, talked about uh, the farmers' protests last year as the trigger point, and which I agree with that very much for the protest, uh, there is a prior history to this, and that would be, and I would actually like to look at the protest as, uh, as uh, having started or having the genesis in the, in the post-war uh, milieu. After the war ended, and that's why I will kind of uh, connect this to the, the question of minorities too. After the war ended, uh, the, the government, I mean, both both the Rajpaks government and the short-lived uh, Ranil Vikram Singh government in the, uh, from 2015 to 19, both of them thought of the nation building as one entity as one nation building and even that i do not have a problem with but as they 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 produce the the thought of nation building uh, which includes or excludes minorities as a liberalized economic uh, program i mean so the nation building then was not seen so much as an ideological uh, nation building project in terms of uh, diversity local needs, regional needs, uh, strengthening uh, social welfare, because we are talking about a, a contingent that kind of had greatly suffered economically. Uh, and instead of thinking of that, they both governments to varying degrees thought of the, uh, the, the, the project development project as liberalization of uh, the economy for the liberalization because that was the trend that was the global uh, trend uh, and uh, while uh, you know i mean i work in the uh, higher education system and we felt it uh, very sharply world bank programs imf programs um, policies impinged upon us into to such a degree that we felt that you know we might have to close shop and look for other uh, jobs because uh, our uh, our jobs and our our skills and our pro and our our kind of uh, uh, outlook was being cited so we are so there is there is a national crisis here and i would like to say that the minorities then are uh, increasingly, I mean, uh, the war created these divisions, the war accentuated the, di the divisions between uh, singular, singular people and the Tamils, and between the Tamils and the Muslims, and, and the Sinhalese and the Muslims. I mean, it, it accentuated, aggravated, and made that the identities of these communities as the foremost, as the kind of the, you know, kind of primordial kind of uh, I, essential identification. But what what the protest? But after the war and as the, as liberalization, kind of you know, kind of uh, in this kind of. Uh, what, what can you say with this iron boots or whatever it is kind of road rush rough shot over uh, all of these identities in some ways there is an increasing trend despite all the differences to be to be thinking of the economy and i i am particularly i was kind of uh, i was looking at vinyari uh, ratna statistics you know this kind of what is collated about the north and east and the north and some of the most i perhaps the most vulnerable community uh, come from comes from the north and the plantation community i mean which is also my lord and the Tamil community, the Muslim community from the East, particularly the Tamil community, and the Muslim community in the North. So, I mean, I think if you're going to talk about the minority issue and democracy, we have to talk about the economy. I mean, the economy is not separate from the war. The economy is not separate from our development program. And the economy is not separate from who, you know, the, the minority, uh, the, the, the North and East, the vulnerable people. And I would like to say how, why that is so, because unless we have a solution or a way out or a, or a, or a, or a, or a hopefulness for these, this 
most vulnerable community in terms of economic upliftment, then we cannot talk of liberal uh, uh, development program. This the capitalist structure, the the structural adjustment program that Indrajit Kumar Sami was talking about is very, I would say, very urban centered. And when I say urban centered, like middle class to elite, and is going to leave out not just the minorities. The and when I say minorities, the vulnerable communities in the north and east, and in the plantation, and in the in other, but also the singular people, also, you know, and when I say minorities, I include Muslims also, who are very much agriculture based. And many had lost their, uh, their livelihood because they had been displaced by war. But as they were trying to come back into the economic system, they were brought down low by the, the, the debt, what you call those, uh, by debt. I mean, if the, a large number of the women who are kind of heading uh, the households today are in, uh, were in serious debt and are in debt. One of the big um, protests before the, the petrol and the farmers' protest was the women's protest last year, early last year, against the leasing companies. One of the biggest protests uh, in the North was about the disappeared children, yes, but also coupled with that was against uh, occupation. And the occupation by the Sri Lankan government is not just about militarization, it is about militarization, but it is also about land being grabbed for development projects. As I speak, I, I saw a notice about Manar, one of the north, uh, northwest, uh, northwest uh, district of the northern province, uh, being turned into a tourist spot without any consultation uh, of the, the communities that are there. And they are, they are doing, most of them are in agriculture. So while the northern and eastern communities have been, have been facing militarization by the state and the kind of single Buddhist ideological rampage, I would say, uh, by the state, at the other end, they also coupled with that, together with that, tourist projects, land grabbing, which is not purely about Buddhization, which is also happening, but also about neoliberal policies being shoved down the throat. Now, what about social welfare? It, social welfare is not just about money. I, you know, I am in the free education system as a university person. Free education, university education, school education has been one of the kind of pillars of social mobility and so social security for the people. And then once you, and all the World Bank measures, and we have been fighting this for the last decade or so, or even longer, the social the, the measures of the world bank and and this kind of upcoming imf structural adjustment program is seriously they seriously erode into the the provision of free education to children and more than children university people so how how is the how are the minorities going to be treated here we are, what, what, what is the, because I look at them as the most vulnerable in, in, in one sense. And cash transfers, money, giving money, asking them to become social entrepreneurs. I mean, this is the cash word. I mean, every budget, I mean, the Rajapaksa, but we want youth to become an entrepreneur. That, that's so laughable. You don't become entrepreneurs like that. You know, I mean, poor people don't become entrepreneurs. You know, some in, then the NGOs will start kind of, I mean, I'm not Sangodi, of course, but you know, I mean, these, these are like catchphrases. They don't go anywhere. So one should do a study of it. So these are the, the whole identity, minority, majority, single Buddhist, I, uh, uh, hegemony, all of that hinges at one level on, on this economic liberalization. So, Okay, I, I'll leave that aside um, and go. Sumati, can I just, uh, well, you, you've had your eight minutes now. Um, okay. So what I was going to ask you, if I may, is, uh, you know, the, this protest movement seems to be an island wine movement, and we've discussed that before. I mean, to what extent do Tamils, Muslims, others 
did they feel part of this movement and to what extent are they hoping that out of this will come a few like a new dispensation which will uh, give them more sense of democracy and participation yeah okay so i would speak again in the kind of a, a futurist sense but since you asked this question there's a large number of tamils and muslims uh, involved in the protest movement. If you had gone to the protest, I mean, the Gota Gogama site in Gaul Face or in other places, the, 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 the meetings that I, I often go to, you, you see a large number of uh, Muslims and Tamils uh, visiting, taking part, uh, holding placards, and then they, if they are in Colombo, then they kind of, you know, do things in Colombo, but they're also coming from other places uh, like uh, like the East, uh, the upcountry in particular, uh, the, the partition committee, they are involved. So again, back to, back to what I wanted to say, and I couldn't kind of overstate this, one of the, you know, problems that we are facing and the minorities are facing is the realization that the economy is critical and the and the economic downturn has brought the people together now tomorrow there's a riot there's a communal riot and it will all kind of there could be a communal riot, a clash somebody might put a bomb somewhere and then the whole thing might kind of disappear but in wherever i've gone i have seen the talk of economy uh, and the other thing is the PTA, the, 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 the Prevention of Terrorism Act that was instituted in 1970, targeting minorities and many in the South, even the left parties in the South didn't really pay a lot of attention to it. But today, because the, the, the protesters are also um, being harassed and uh, arrested and kept in detention, there is a national wide movement uh, against the PTA. So there was the march uh, a few weeks ago, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, from Kankesanthura in the north, not a march, but a, pit, a campaign, Kankesanthura in which the Tamil National Alliance took place, uh, took part, to uh, the south. So there was this campaign to get rid of the PTA. It has not gathered, uh, gained a lot of uh, attention because there's repression today the severe repression, right, today. So the media is maybe not be picking it up, the foreign media may not be picking it up, but that is happening. Then the abolishing of the executive, so the executive presidency, these are aspects that really clearly have an impact on uh, the minority. So they are invested in this in the different ways. If you go to the North and I go to the North because I'm also from the North. So I have discussions with them, with the people there. They are slightly like, okay, now we were all fighting those days and nobody helped, uh, nobody talked about us. We were under the PTA, people died and all that, nobody. And now everybody wants us to join. So there is a little bit of a, uh, uh, what can I, a uh, quizzicalness, uh, a little skepticism, a little kind of, uh, yeah, hesitation. But increasingly, that's also breaking down. And I would say again and again that the, that the question of economy cannot be uh, overstated. Uh, yes. So, no. yeah, yeah, okay. So, and so to, to sum up, uh, I would say this is the moment. And it's a very fragile unity. I don't want to think, I don't want to say all the uh, ethnic communities are coming together in some kind of happy family. No, this is a fragile unity. It's not even a unity, but a realization that there is a common problem here. It may not be a common future, but there is a common conundrum, the economy, you know, and that touches upon all walks of life, your health, your education, your, your, your employment. Right, mm. and that that common realize that cause realization is bringing people together. Very and good. It, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. That's so really, I'll very, stop very, very interesting. The fact that you're stressing this economic dimension really more than the political dimension in terms of devolution of power, but uh, you feel that the abolition of the executive presidency, which has been one of the demands, that will have some impact on the economy as well as the political side of things. Mm. Um, yes, because we are working on, we are thinking about, uh, you know, people gaining, I mean, okay, I'll, I'll put it this way. 
the executive presidency has been overall for the entire country has been, uh, it has kind of made political representatives of the, I mean, the parliament so, uh, so uh, disconnected from the people because they have become patronage, it's become a, a politics of patronage. The, the representatives are beholden to the president and not to the people. So th there is something very, very wrong. I have written about it. I, I kind of, I'm rushing a bit, so I can't really tell you exactly how it works, right? Um, but uh, the executive presidency has ruined, in a way, political mobilization. So now we are kind of even people, people you know, in, 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 in uh, across the country, in fact, are talking about people's councils, uh, how we can mobilize people. So the protests actually have not died down. The protest has kind of consolidating itself. I may be kind of slightly exaggerating it, but I think I'm right in the sense, if you think of it in a, in a futurist sense, the protests have not, uh, are not over. Right. They're just Thank you kind of, much. yeah. Thank you, Samadhi, very much. Okay. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm conscious that, uh, um, Binya, I um, uh, brought your um, very interesting um, presentation to a rather abrupt end because I was slightly worried about the timings. But can we come back to you now, perhaps, um, and just ask you a little bit about the international response to this, uh, this crisis? I mean, how far um, have, uh, you know, how far have the UN and other organizations stepped up in order to help uh, the country to deal with what, from your presentation, is, is the most extraordinarily severe uh, crisis of ordinary people? Um, yes. Um, actually, uh, UN uh, made an appeal about uh, three months back. Uh, that appeal uh, was uh, to support Sri Lanka, particularly in the food uh, crisis, uh, an integrated uh, uh, plan. And uh, it was uh, looking for something like uh, 47 million rupees. Uh, however, uh, so far, the appeal has not uh, brought in more than uh, probably 15 million US dollars. I think one of the reasons is that there is a perception, I must be very open here, uh, from outside donors, that uh, any support to Sri Lanka, if it is also like uh, channeled in a way that will have, uh, uh, you know, state involvement where uh, corruption is rampant, uh, I think uh, the donors don't have uh, confidence in uh, supporting. However, despite uh, the uh, uh, lower, uh, uh, the, the not, a, not very impressive response from the donor community to the UN appeal, there had been a lot of private donors as well as multi multilateral other uh, multilateral donors including the uh, adb and the world bank uh, repurposing their some of their projects which were meant for other work and then channeling to urgent needs such as uh, food as well as uh, medicines so uh, that has been quite effective but i think there is a serious issue when it comes to governance procurement uh, uh, procedures have not been uh, streamlined, so there is still a lot of concern about, amongst the, uh, the, the donors that unless you uh, have these uh, 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 procedures uh, very much uh, transparent and also accountable, uh, then uh, the, the funds will be uh, wasted. But uh, we really need uh, support. I think uh, we are in a very acute phase for the next six to nine months is a really, really acute phase because we will have uh, uh, this uh, lean uh, harvest period coming in October to November. So in, during those two months, uh, we'll also have a, a, a probably a shortage of uh, availability of uh, food, essential food items and the prices uh, will continue to rise. Then in that situation, we'll get into a uh, worse uh, crisis. So we have to avoid that. The World Food Programme is helping Sarvodaya, is it? And so there are um, there are organizations that have got funds that can put them through the NGO sector and be more confident than perhaps that it's going to be well directed. Yes. Right. So at the moment, uh, the food assistance and also the cash transfers are done outside the state system. 
so the WFP assistance is in two forms. One is uh, cash transfers to identified uh, low-income households. And we are involved in that. Uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Kumaraswamy said, uh, the, the transfers are made directly to the bank accounts of the individual. So there is no uh, direct uh, state involvement, but there is a verification process. And the lists are being given by the respective uh, government uh, uh, sec uh, the divisional secretaries at the uh, at the ground at the district level uh, so they, then once these lists are there then we help in verifying whether they are really deserving in terms of the criteria that have been set by the un and agreed by the government as well so they are without as you say uh, the direct involvement of the uh, the state uh, machinery administrative machinery we are delivering and reaching uh, at the moment about i think 200000 uh, families who are in urgent need do you think there's more that the Commonwealth could do? I don't know. Um, in, Indrajit, you, you were very much involved with the, in the Commonwealth uh, uh, Secretariat for, for, for many years. I mean, do you think that there's anything more that we can, the Commonwealth could do to help Sri Lanka? Or Vinaya, what is your view? What, what, what further international aid might be sought? Yes, I think uh, definitely we'll have, we will need the international assistance, but it has to be also uh, uh, put it in a uh, put. Uh, I mean, done in a way that it, it becomes uh, sustainable and also help in the recovery process as well. So at the moment, we we don't see a, a real. Uh, commitment by the government because the priorities are not, uh, uh, I mean, priorities are different for the government. For example, last two weeks, we have seen uh, uh, the appointment of, you know, large numbers of state ministers. And next week, after our president returned from uh, UK, I think they are going to appoint more cabinet ministers. So I think they just didn't have the this whole crisis to be uh, given priority in terms of recovery and, you know, uh, having a transition towards a more stable um, longer-term recovery plan. So I think the donor support is required for the emergency phase as well, but also to probably uh, help in, for example, recovery of collapsed businesses, small enterprises. They are having a real hard time. In Sri Lanka, the, the uh, economy is very much uh, uh, su supported by these uh, small and medium enterprises. So unless you provide urgent support, so it has to be a continuum, uh, support for uh, food and medicines and you know urgent uh, urgent needs to uh, to the low income groups uh, maybe through cash transfers or, or uh, goods transfer but then uh, also shifting to more economic support at a at a uh, sme level uh, indrajit uh, could i ask you perhaps about that do you think the commonwealth could be uh, asked to do more has it been doing enough The, um, the Commonwealth is good at setting standards, exchanging good practice, um, technical assistance. Historically, it has not got involved in humanitarian assistance because there are other agencies which do so and have you know, capacity and expertise to do so. So as far as the humanitarian assistance is concerned, I think you know the World Food Program, uh, UNICEF, et cetera, who have the track record of uh, providing this assistance are probably better placed. And if any government wants to channel money to Sri Lanka, it's probably better to use tried and tested channels. Where the Commonwealth can do is really perhaps more in terms of the recovery phase to try to help set standards, um, which, which, uh, which would make sure that this kind of thing never happens again. Yes. Would you like to respond uh, um, also, um, Indrajit, to, to um, Sumati, Sumati's criticism <laughs> yes, of yes, the yes. IMF and the IMF type solutions and the fact that yes, yes. there is a feeling well, well, amongst I, you know, minorities that yes. they will be um, uh, they will be neglected in this, even even the Sinhalese agriculturalists. That is an urban based kind of perspective. Yeah. So let me say this. Um, I think Sumati and I have two very different worldviews and you know, we can agree to disagree. I mean, that's fine. Um, but um, one thing I must say before I get, I get on to answering your question is that the IMF does not advocate cutting provision for education and health. It does not advocate cutting provision for social protection. 
Um, it does advocate uh, having, you know, for social protection, having better designed, better targeted policies. Uh, but they, they, they don't, I have never seen a program which said, you know, reduce expenditure on education, they reduce expenditure on health, uh, cut your social protection. It is up to governments. The IMF sets macro targets. It says that your budget must have a primary surplus, your budget surplus must be so much, then it's up to the governments to work out how they achieve those targets. So if, if during an IMF program, education or health is cut, that is not the IMF saying that you should cut it. It's the government has decided that its priorities are such that it is going to cut education and health. So I think we, we need to be careful as to um, you know, identifying where who, who does what in, in these programs. Um, okay. Um, yeah. Could I, thank you. Uh, could, could I, Bandana, could I come back to um, uh, you, please, on this? Uh, in fact, to all panelists, a, a question from um, Mark Robinson. Uh, how credible is uh, the present president in this situation, given that he um, is so dependent on the uh, on the SLPP, and and given that, um, as um, Vinya was saying, that, that there have recently been this these appointments of many state ministers, which doesn't uh, suggest um, any sort of austerity is being implemented. Um, Mandana, would you like to comment on that? Uh, yes, David. Uh, well, basically, there is a question of legitimacy that has been there since the beginning of uh, the presidency of uh, the current uh, President Ranil Vikramasinghe, especially given the fact that he was voted into the presidency by a parliament that has lost its mandate, its legitimacy, basically, because the, the mandate received by the so-called ruling party at the moment that is headed by the Rajapaksas is not the same that they pulled in 2020. So the argument is that given the, given the situation where the ruling party has lost its mandate, whether the election of this president was also legal in that sense, I mean, that's a legitimacy is, issue. Of course, the fact that he was voted uh, with a majority vote uh, in parliament makes him constitutionally the president, but there is, when it comes to public opinion and legitimacy, there, there are still remain questions. And the fact that the president is dependent on the party led by the Rajapaksas and the party that has been directly blamed by the people for the economic mismanagement. And then although there has been uh, continuous issues as uh, Vinya pointed out during his, uh, his statement, since uh, since 2019, the Easter Sunday attacks and then the COVID pandemic and so on. I mean, the reason there is a government is to manage such situations. If by any chance, if the government is going to say we have run out of money, so we have no way of addressing these issues, then there is no need for a government to say that to the public. The public has voted in their representatives into office with the faith that they will govern and govern in a manner that would not take the country down the path of ruination that it has faced now. So uh, the fact that the current president depends heavily on the party that is being blamed by a majority of the public at the moment for the current crisis uh, is going to cause uh, issues for the president also to move forward in a sense. Unless, if, unless he comes forward with the with some form of mechanism where he can get the people, uh, the civil society and the youth who have been calling for change involved in the governance process in some form and uh, looking at implementing some of their recommendations in the actual governance process. If such a scenario takes place, I think the president will be able to move forward. But uh, as pointed out by uh, Vinya again, I mean, given the fact that uh, there are 37 state ministers, I mean, 38, since there was an additional later on, 38 state ministers, although the government has said that uh, they, are, they will only work on an MP's salary, we saw, I mean, already in the media, several of the state ministers have come out publicly and said that they will uh, basically require all the all the benefits that are assigned to a state minister. So basically we are looking at a scenario where the public expenditure is continuing to increase while the government continues to burden the public 
with uh, high utility bills and everything. I mean, there has to be some form of balance in, especially during an economic crisis. So the, hey. the president is going to have a difficult time in balancing this situation. Thank you, thank you. Well, I'm afraid um, uh, we have actually now um, completed our one and a half hour discussion. Um, it's been extremely illuminating, I think. Uh, if I could say so, I mean, it, 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 Vinya, your, your slides on the actual um, situation in terms of nutrition and health in Sri Lanka, that, that has been a, an eye opener for me, certainly. Uh, and uh, I think has shown probably many of us the depths of the, of the economic um, hardship that Sri Lanka is going through. And um, it's regrettable that really the, um, the international response to this uh, has not been um, as, uh, as sort of uh, forthcoming as one would have hoped. Um, obviously, the, the, the political situation facing the government is, is very uh, challenging. And the fact that you know the government is not listening to the protest movement, uh, and, and in fact seems to be uh, uh, moving more towards the uh, the the, uh, the SLPP, which has lost credibility, it, it, it does store up um, a lot of potential um, trouble for the future. Um, anyway, many thanks to our speakers. Um, for what has been a very illuminating discussion. And I should just now like to ask Sue Onslow, the director of the Institute, to say a word of her own uh, by way of thanks. Thank you very much, David. I'd like to endorse David's thanks to all of our speakers for their detailed and cogent presentations on and for their contribution of sophisticated analysis and summarizing the multi-dimensional crisis across Sri Lanka, um, the importance of the long-term drivers, the, the catalytic factors, but also where are the possibilities of change, but also the very real dangers that continue to confront um, uh, Sri Lankans in terms of social fractures, the very real social distress, and also the political misperceptions which seem to be at play. Um, it is uh, of acute concern. Yes. Uh, to um, us outside in the Commonwealth. I would be very interested to know what the Sri Lankan diaspora is able to do in addition to those external donors to which you made reference, Vinya. Um, it is, uh, well, I, to a degree reassuring that a, a, a level of agreement has been reached with the IMF, but it's clearly a very hard row, um, road ahead. And it does beg the question whether there is sufficient political by and political commitment uh, to achieve the necessary uh, macro and systemic uh, reforms for Sri Lanka that the country deserves. So I just would like to thank each of our speakers again. Uh, this has been an excellent discussion, a wonderful contribution to um, our podcast series. And uh, we very much hope that we can continue this discussion in future.